a lot of innovation involves taking ideas from different areas of life and kind of combining them in new ways. And um, that's a very powerful way to innovate. In fact, it's probably the main way in which people innovate. And some of the most powerful innovations that we've actually seen in the world are ones that kind of take ideas from areas that people don't think are related to each other and put them together in a really in insightful way. And uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and firms can really benefit from being able to do that. But, but it raises an interesting puzzle, right, or an interesting challenge, really, which is uh, when you do that, you then have to con try to explain to people what this is. And, and what you're doing when you're borrowing from those different categories, or you're taking ideas from different domains, or you're taking an idea from biology and you're combining it with an idea from computer science, so let's say, um, now you have this kind of hybrid product that's kind of mixed of these two different things. And the problem is that people, the rest of the world, doesn't think about the hybrids. They think about things in terms of the existing categories. And so we think about firms as being auto manufacturers, and we think about firms as being um, you know, telephone manufacturers, right, or something like that. And um, a good example is a product like a digital camera, right? When digital cameras first came out, digital cameras are kind of a combination of a computer, an electronics device, and a camera, right? Like a film camera with the lens and so on and so forth. That poses a challenge for, for stakeholders, for, for consumers, for, for investors, and for others, because how do you make sense of, of that? So when you first see a digital camera, is it an example of a camera, or is it an example of an electronics device, or is it an example of a computer peripheral? Um, and a lot of what my work looks at is kind of trying to understand how that ambiguity that's inherent in kind of in, in a genu genuinely innovative new product um, affects uh, the strategies and kind of the, the, the success of firms. If people can't kind of classify products or services into things that they already understand, then they have to engage in kind of effortful reasoning to make sense of them, right, and to, to try to understand what they're doing. And the more you have to do that, it actually turns out, the less you are likely to value it, right? Like the, we tend to value things, the, the more the easier it is for us to recognize uh, what it is that they are. And so the challenge for, for innovators and for entrepreneurs is to find a way to, to help make it easy for people to make sense of the product or innovation that you have come up with. And oftentimes the way they do that is through analogy. So we, we use the power of analogy as a way of getting people to anchor on a certain set of expectations and then use that uh, to interpret the new device, right? So we say, well, the iPhone is like a cell phone except that it also has the following features. Um, or we say that a digital camera is like a camera, but it also has the following features. And by doing that, we, on the one hand, invoke a lot of um, associations that are really helpful, but we can also constrain ourselves in different kinds of ways because we might end up with associations with our product that we don't necessarily want. It also creates a really hard strategic challenge uh, for the company because you, because you're choosing from lots of different categories, you have different choices in terms of what analogy you're going to draw. Are you going to say it's more like this category or are you more, more like that category? Obviously, what's hard about that when you're in a new product category and you're new innovative category um, is for the entrepreneurs, you don't know which one you're supposed to put your bets on. And so that feels really risky. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it, right? That you still have to make a bet. And so you have to kind of take what your best guess is for what the right analogy is. Uh, because otherwise you just end up as a model and then nobody can really make sense of it and you, they tend to devalue you for that reason. So if you're a big established company, then people try to look at that product and they say, oh, this must somehow be related to what they already do. And that puts a constraint on kind of how people make sense of it and therefore affects your ability to be innovative. I think a good example comes from the realm of, of digital cameras. So when digital cameras were first introduced, what you saw was producers from all different kinds of industries. In particular, you saw the traditional film camera producers enter into the market and start making 
uh, digital cameras. So you saw the Nikon and the Canons and so on and so forth. But you also saw computer companies come in. So you saw HP make digital cameras and you saw electronics firms like Sony or Panasonic come into the uh, digital camera business as well. And one of the things that my research shows is kind of early in the history of the industry, uh, you were actually better off uh, in terms of how consumers thought about the quality of your product um, if you were a producer who had a history of making film cameras. And my understanding of that, or the way I explain that, is that really what that is about is about what kind of mental models they applied to the product that they saw. And so that if you saw a uh, digital camera that was made by Hewlett Packard, you tended to interpret that through the lens of what a computer peripheral manufacturer would make or a computer manufacturer would make. And that set your expectations for what the product could or couldn't do. While if you were coming at it from the lens of you looking at a product that Nikon had made, then your expectations are shaped by what a traditional camera manufacturer was, was, was able to do. Um, and those things make a big difference. And so I think the lesson for large firms is that really your existing identity in the market, like the kinds of products and services that you're known for, can really um, restrict your ability to introduce uh, new new products into the market if they're genuinely innovative and genuinely different from what you already know how to do. That doesn't mean you can't introduce them, but you have to do it in a different way. Because if if you do it kind of under your own brand name, then people get start to invoke those associations with your existing products, and that might not be the best way to actually go. I think startups have a have a big advantage in the sense that they don't have the the, the legacy of the past or the burden of the past, right? So so a startup comes on up on the scene with a new technology, nobody has an association with any existing set of products. So on the one hand, that's a that's a that's a liability because you got to build up a reputation, you got to kind of establish what kind of product it is, and and so on and so forth. But it can also be be an advantage because you have more degrees of freedom, you have more latitude to choose how it is that you want to portray what it is that you're actually producing and what the value of your product is. I think entrepreneurs and innovators oftentimes think about the, the hard part being the technical side of, of the innovation, right? So how do I really get those components to work together in the way that I have imagined that they will? And there's no doubt that the technical side of it is really important. But we, we have to not lose sight of the social side of it as well, right? And kind of the, the external facing, how is it that people are going to make sense of your product relative to all the other products that exist out there in the world? And that's a very hard part of it as well. And the really successful entrepreneurs are going to be the ones who solve both the technical problem and the market identity problem.